Hello lovely people. In today's video, can a disabled person become president of the United States of America? And how many disabled presidents have there already been? If you love learning more about the history you weren't taught in school, that's the queer disabled stuff. Then I suggest you subscribe to me and check out my historical profiles playlist where you'll find lots more videos like this one. In 2001, when George W. Bush became president, many people asked whether he might have a learning disability like dyslexia due to his frequent mispronunciations and malapropisms. A malapropism, by the way, is incorrectly using a word in place of a word with a similar sound but a different meaning, resulting in nonsensical and likely humorous speech. They often occur as errors in natural speech and are more common in people who have dyslexia or similar conditions where the brain is just sort of wired slightly differently to the norm. The name comes from the character Mrs. Malaprop in the 1775 play The Rivals by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Mrs. Malaprop constantly misspeaks to comic effect by using words which don't have the meaning she intends, but sound similar to the one she's reaching for. Her name is referenced to the word malapropos, an adjective or adverb meaning inappropriate or inappropriately, derived from the French phrase mal à propos. I don't know anything. Melopropos. Yes, that was my attempt at a French accent. Don't judge me, I'm deaf. And I will play that card whenever I need to. Whilst Bush never confirmed his having dyslexia and in fact actively denied it, this isn't very surprising. Yes, we now live in a time when disability, either visual or invisible, can be identified and diagnosed properly, but this wouldn't be the first time a president's hidden having one. Not that I'm saying he actually does have dyslexia. Public service announcement! Do not make assumptions about people's medical records. Unless they're dead presidents. Information on the presidents I'm talking about here has been released to the public either during or after their term. It's more than just speculating to your friends about that kid at school you're not very keen on. Which is gossip. Look at that! A winding path I led you down just for a PSA. And so I can gossip about dead presidents. Most people think of Franklin D. Roosevelt when the term disabled president comes up. But there have actually been a long line of presidents with a variety of disabilities, including hearing loss and epilepsy. For the majority of these men, and they're obviously all men, just saying. For the majority of these men, publicly acknowledging their disability during their lifetime was discouraged. But I think it's important that we celebrate them today to show that being disabled doesn't make you lesser and it doesn't stop you from achieving or leading. Indeed, the very first president of the United States of America, George Washington, struggled with what would likely today be diagnosed as a form of dyslexia. He struggled with spelling and grammar and taught himself to correct the problem to a degree, but it didn't stop him from being commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War, and clearly no one cared about stupid old spellings when he was unanimously elected as first president. I mean, that certainly makes my dyslexic little heart happy. Other presidents believed to have dyslexia were Thomas Jefferson, who also had a stutter, a personal library containing thousands of books, and authored the Declaration of Independence, Woodrow Wilson, who could barely read by the age of 10, but was a great talker and adept at the art of debate, which led him to studying law, becoming president of Princeton University, and later the 28th president of the United States. He also suffered a stroke whilst in office that left him partially paralyzed. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who pushed past dyslexia to become a five-star general, president of Columbia University, and 34th president of the United States. And John F. Kennedy, who does not share my initials, even though people keep telling me they're the same. JFK also had chronic back pain from an accident while he was at Harvard College. The injury it left him with was so severe that it initially disqualified him from military service until his father pulled some strokes so he could join the Navy Reserve. He battled through injury to be awarded the Purple Heart and the World War II Victory Medal, serving in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Which, can't lie, as a Brit, still a little fuzzy on what the difference is there. Please explain like I'm a child. He became the 35th president of the United States in 1960. It wasn't just learning difficulties like dyslexia that the president dealt with, however. 40th president, Ronald Reagan, was incredibly nearsighted to the extent that he always had to sit in the front row of classrooms. He chose not to correct it, however, and instead, when giving speeches, wore a contact lens in just one eye so he could observe the audience reactions whilst reading his notes with the other eye. I imagine not at the same time. Still genius. He also wore a hearing aid due to an accident on set as a young actor when someone let a gun off too close to his head. 
guns, they're dangerous. Bill Clinton also wore a hearing aid as he dealt with a high frequency hearing loss, but it didn't stop him becoming 42nd President of the United States or playing saxophone. In earlier times, James Madison, who proposed the first 12 amendments of the Constitution, became the fourth president and was so bright he completed college in just two years, dealt with epilepsy his entire life. Did that stop him? No. Can you see where this video is going? Even very famous President Abraham Lincoln, uh, look Americans, okay, there are only a handful of your presidents that the rest of the world can name, so. Abraham Lincoln dealt with a health condition. It's believed he suffered from Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic disorder of the connective tissues. So yay, some representation for my connective tissue issue chance. Lincoln also battled with depression so severe it caused incapacitating physical ailments. But it didn't stop him being a lawyer, a member of the House of Representatives and president during the American Civil War. Illness could inspire presidents, as Theodore Roosevelt proved. He was nearsighted and experienced severe bronchial asthma as a child that started his physical growth. But he used this to spur himself on and lived a strenuous life, enjoying nature and serving as lieutenant colonel of the Rough Rider Regiment, which is nice to say, during the Spanish and American Civil War. And obviously later becoming president of the United States. This physically punishing lifestyle wasn't always a great idea, however, as during a boxing match, he detached a retina, which resulted in blindness, so. Boxing, why do that? What a hot take. It was his fifth cousin and 32nd president who really proved what it takes to overcome physical adversity, however. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was partially paralyzed by polio in 1921, but became president just 11 years later, serving for an unprecedented four terms and led the USA out of the Great Depression and to victory in World War II. He's a big deal. Although dealing with the crippling pain and paralysis of the disease was difficult, many people believe that this is what helped shape him, both as a man and as a president. However, he was determined to be judged on his merits and not just seen as the disabled president, so he was rarely photographed in his wheelchair and he rarely transferred from chairs or vehicles in front of the public. FDR was born on January the 30th, 1882, in the Hudson Valley town of Hyde Park, New York, to businessman James Roosevelt I and his second wife, Sarah Ann Delano. His parents, who were sixth cousins, a trend we will see reappear later, both came from wealthy old families. Growing up, he learnt to ride, shoot, row, play polo and lawn tennis. In his teen years, he took up golf and was very skilled, becoming club champion in his late teen years at the golf club on Campobello Island in New Brunswick, Canada, where his family had a summer cottage. I say cottage, but I imagine it was very large. He was an average student and athlete, but whilst at Harvard University, became editor-in-chief of the daily newspaper, The Harvard Crimson, showing great energy, ambition, and the ability to manage others. Franklin began courting his future wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, whom he had been acquainted as a child, because they were fifth cousins, once removed and she was the niece of President Theodore Roosevelt. They were married in March 1905, despite his mother Sarah protesting that Franklin was too young and attempting to break up the couple. Although, I mean, she liked Eleanor well enough, she was fiercely possessive of her son and insisted that they move into the family estate with her after the wedding. She also, along with Franklin, planned, built and furnished a townhouse in New York City with a twin house for herself right next door. Eleanor never quite felt at home in either of these houses, but loved the family's vacation home on Campobello Island, which Sarah gave to the young couple outright. It was here on Campobello Island, however, that Franklin manifested the symptoms of deadly polio. During the summer of 1921, Franklin, who by this point had been a state senator and an assistant secretary to the Navy, along with having run for vice president already, was enjoying a day of sailing on his yacht when suddenly he could no longer stand and slipped overboard into icy waters. The following day, he was troubled by lower back pain and went for a swim in hopes of easing the soreness. As the day progressed, however, he felt his legs become weaker and by the third day, he could no longer hold his own weight. His skin quickly became very sensitive and eventually even a slight breeze across his body caused great pain. Eleanor could not bear to see her beloved husband in such distress and contacted a number of doctors, hoping one would be able to diagnose and remedy his illness. It took over a month before he was diagnosed in late August of that year with infantile paralysis, otherwise known as polio. The infantile part of the name probably gives you a clue as to why they didn't think about it straight away. 
It was uncommon for a middle-aged person at that time, Franklin was 39, to contract polio. Most cases of the disease were acquired during infancy, with the majority of children becoming immune by the age of four. At the time, polio had no known cure and often resulted in full or partial paralysis and the erosion of motor skills. Dr. Robert Lavitt, an expert on the disease, suggested that Franklin take hot baths to ease his pain and told the couple that in order for a person to combat polio and to develop immunity to the disease, they must be in good emotional and physical health with a good immune system. Franklin thought back to his youth and realized that he'd actually been frequently ill and had been leading a stressful life in politics over the last years that may have weakened his immunity. He thus decided to remove himself from political life in order to begin his rehabilitation at home in Hyde Park, New York. He swam three times a week, recognizing that his legs could support the weight of his body in water and that this meant it was a good way to build up strength. By winter, his arms had regained strength and his nervous system was functioning normally whilst his stomach and lower back were slowly improving. His legs had not recovered well, and in January, Franklin was fitted with leg braces that locked at the knee and allowed him to stand with help. He believed he would one day be able to walk again if he just continued exercising and insisted that he be surrounded by good cheer throughout rehabilitation. Not one to slack, Franklin made physiotherapy exercises part of his social schedule and had friends join him for company as he exercised. He also involved his children and family with his daily rehabilitation. Whilst it was difficult for them at first, they eventually became comfortable and even proactively involved themselves with his recovery. His wife Eleanor recalled in her autobiography the perfect naturalness with which the children accepted his limitations, though they had always known him as an active person, helped him tremendously in his own acceptance of them. During his rehabilitation process, he was contacted by a friend who knew of a man who had been cured of polio by the healing waters of a place called Warm Springs in Georgia, the state. The resort's water came from a mountain and was known to be both extremely pure and rich in mineral content. Ultimately, the waters did not cure him, but they definitely helped. And when, in 1926, the resort was having financial issues, Franklin stepped in and bought the facility, transforming it into a rehabilitation center for polio patients like himself. Although his efforts and exercises paid off, he remained semi-paraplegic. Despite his faith that he would one day walk again, he gave himself a personal ultimatum. He either needed to accept himself as he was and return to politics, or else give up his political dreams and push himself harder to recover. His stubborn confidence and belief that he could do more helping others by taking office, along with his wife's support, led him to resume his political career. His mother wasn't very pleased, but she probably wouldn't have been unless he was in a bubble, cotton wool, and stuck firmly to her side. Although there were public rumors about his health and physical state, not many people knew what exactly had happened to FDR, and he was unsure as he made his way back into political life how the public would react to his disability. During the 1920s, disabled people were treated poorly, often abandoned in asylums, hidden from public view, and disregarded by their family. It was thought that disabled people were not employable and had no place in society. It must have been incredibly difficult to stay strong emotionally and risk his cheery confidence whilst making his way back into the public eye. Although people were curious about his condition, American citizens appeared more sympathetic than embarrassed. This acceptance helped Franklin's good cheer and he ran for governor of New York in 1928. Clearly, his disability did not affect voters, as he held the governorship for two terms until starting a run for the president in the 1932 election. Franklin's political advisers feared that his opponents would call him names and use his disability against him, but it was never brought up as a problem throughout his 1932 campaign and did not affect public support of him. In private, Franklin used a wheelchair that he had personally designed, as the chairs of the time were one-size-fits-all, bulky and difficult to get around in. Ah, bringing back my NHS wheelchair memories. Buildings at the time were not generally wheelchair accessible because why would they be? They actively disliked disabled people being around. Therefore, Franklin needed something small, efficient, and discreet. He took a dining chair and added small bicycle wheels backwards to the large wheels at the back and smaller wheels at the front that we see today. This meant not only that the chair was small and could move around tight corners, but that there was less chair between Franklin and a person standing in front of him. It had the added benefit of being made from an object that people were used to seeing in their own houses and thus didn't call a lot of attention. It cannot be said that he was completely comfortable being open about his situation. 
Although his disability did not directly interfere with his role as president, it was assumed that foreign powers and even his own people would see his paralysis as a weakness rather than seeing the strength it took for someone to come back from such an illness and still take public office. When giving a speech in public, Franklin could have chosen to navigate the stage in his wheelchair, but he never wanted to give Americans the impression that he was helpless. Instead, to give the impression that he could walk, he would traverse the stage wearing leg braces under his trousers and using a cane on one side whilst holding the arm of another person on his other. By swinging his hips, he could sway his legs forwards and thus give the impression that he was walking. He knew that for the public to see his capable mind, they would need to be able to see past his frail body. It 100% would not have worked with today's cameras and media picking everything apart that our politicians do, but it was more the idea of strength that the public needed. He was greatly helped by the press, who accepted the White House's request to avoid photographing him walking, manoeuvring, or transferring from vehicles. The Secret Service purposefully interfered with anyone attempting to take a photo of the president in a weak state. Although returning to politics meant he had to put his own recovery in the back burner, Franklin made sure to centre helping others who suffered from polio. In 1934, after funding issues arose with his polio hydrotherapy centre, Warm Springs, he held a birthday ball, encouraged donations, and in one night raised $1 million to keep the centre open. In 1938, he created the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which funded research for the Salk vaccine to treat polio. Thanks to the successful vaccination program, polio went from 35,000 cases in the 1940s to 15,000 cases in the 1950s to 100 cases in the 1960s and just 10 in the 1970s. And since then, the United States of America is polio free. Which is not a reason to not vaccinate your children for Christ's sake. FDR's wife, Eleanor, called his disability a blessing in disguise as it helped him to look at the bigger picture rather than focusing on small and unimportant things. Everything he achieved was so much harder fought than other people realized. The way Franklin confidently viewed himself as a person, a politician, and a father, rather than just an invalid to be frowned upon and locked away, helped to change America's view of disabled people. He was the only president to serve for more than two terms. He steered the country out of the Great Depression and through the Second World War, and he became a symbol of strength and perseverance. There's a lovely quote from him in Eleanor Roosevelt's book, you learn by living. You gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like to support this channel, then please do subscribe and check out my merch, available from the link in the end screen that's popping up right now.